الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا إلى يوم الدين أما بعد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في القرآن المجيد والفرقان الحميد إن الذين سبقت لهم من الحسن أولئك عنها مبعدون لا يسمعون حسيسها وقال تعالى وَاعْتَدْنَا لِمَنْ كَذَّبَ بِالسَّاعَةِ سَعِيرًا إذا رأتهم من مكان بعيد سمعوا لها تغيظا وزفيرا صدق الله العظيم So to continue on the discussion of uh, Hellfire and its details Today we move on to um, one of the really uh, prominent uh, verses uh, which discuss a very a specific aspect of hellfire uh, now remember this this entire series is going to be based on the verses of the Quran and the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because that is where we get uh, this information from that is where we get these details from so today uh, it's Ibn uh, Rajab al-Hanbali's uh, 12th chapter which is regarding the raging and the roaring of hellfire the raging and the roaring of hellfire Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the verse that I recited at the beginning in the Ladina Sabakat Lahum Min Al Husna Ulaika Anha Mubadun La Yasmauna Hasisaha. So this is in Suratul Anbiya one oh one and one oh two that those uh, from whom uh, basically have goodness uh, that has been sent forth uh, from us, these people, meaning those who have done good and those who have good in store for them, they're going to be kept very distant and very far away from hellfire to such a degree that لا يسمعون حسيسها, they will actually not even hear the slightest sound from it. They'll be totally veiled from it because paradise, that's where they're going to be. It's going to be a place of absolute joy. There's going to be absolutely no form of, no form of difficulty, no form of nuisance, no irritation, nothing, not even a sound. Like right now, um, you know, there'll be sounds of cars passing by. There'll be a very loud motorbike that sometimes goes past. Right, you know, enjoying the roar of their motorbike, but it, it actually is bothering so many different people, especially when they do it at night. Right, but in paradise, there will be actually no such thing. I mean, you've got an entire expanse in paradise, a huge estate, right, ten times the size of this world at minimum. Right, what kind of nuisance are you going to hear from there? Far, Jah Jahannam is going to be far away from that. That's why that's where we want to be, not in Jahannam. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala also says in Surah Al Furqan, verse eleven and twelve. وَأَعْتَدْنَا لِمَنْ كَذَّبَ بِالسَّاعَةِ سَعِيرًا We have prepared for those who have denied the final hour, the day of judgment, we've prepared a fire for them. إِذَا رَأَتْهُمْ مِنْ مَكَانٍ بَعِيدٍ if, Even when they look at it, even when they set eyes on it, and when they even glance at it from a very far distance, even from that far distance, they will actually hear the تَغَيُّضْ and the zafir, which is essentially the raging and the roaring of the hellfire. Now you can imagine this fire which is raging and roaring. This is what Allah says, تَغَيُّضْ and Zafir. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then also says in Surah Al-Mulk, right? And you must have read this verse, وَالَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا بِرَبِّهِمْ عَذَابُ جَهَنَّمَ وَبِئْسَ الْمَصِيرِ إِذَا أُلْقُوا فِيهَا سَمِعُوا لَهَا شَهِيقًا وَهِيَ تَفُورُ تَكَادُ تَمَيَّزُ مِنَ الْغَيْضِ Verse 6, and, uh, 6 to 8 of Surah Al-Mulk, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that those who disbelieve in their Lord, for them is the punishment of the hellfire and what a bad place to return to. When they're thrown into it, they will hear, they will hear shahiq. They will hear its blaring. Shahiq refers to a blaring sound, a gasping sound. A roaring sound. So they will hear the roar, the gas, the blaring of paradise. Wahiya tafur while it is boiling up. So they're hearing this sound because because hellfire is boiling up. It's boiling over. It's blazing forth. It's seething. It's heaving. These are all the words that you can use to describe what's going on. It's just heaving with this fire, just this eruption that's going on, and you'll hear this huge roar of it even from a distance. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala carries on with the discussion, says, تَكَادُ تَمَيَّزُ مِنَ الْغَيْظِ 
it is almost bursting with fury and rage. The region, it, it, it almost seems like it's someone who's got so angry that it's just boiling up, boiling over and bursting with fury and with rage. Ghayv refers to when a person is in rage. So that's hellfire has been described, tamayyas. And we'll describe this... Um, Allah, Allah. The ulama, the muhaddithin, the, sorry, the, the mufassirin, the early mufassirin, as they've described all of these words and they've explained this in, in more, uh, uh, in more uh, vivid terms. So, shahiq, the word that's used, shah, they will hear from it a shahiq, which I translate as a blaring or a gasping or a roaring. It's generally used for the sound that comes from the... Uh, it's a sound that generally comes from the stomach of a human being or an animal Just like the braying of a donkey, but obviously with a fire. It's actually worse than that Right, that's why Rabi relates uh, Rabi ibn Anas says this a shahiq of his sadr It's this really deep kind of raging rumbling sound from the heart when you just magnify that to the to the hellfire right and wahiya tafur Wahiya tafur, boiling up, boiling over. That's just like when you've got a pot of water or milk and it's just boiling over. It's just going over. It's just frothing and going over when it's got intense heat. Then when it says, Takadu tamayyazu min al almost bursting forth. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, he describes this that the fire seems like it's going to separate. Right, you know, fire, it's a huge mass of fire, the red ball of fire, right, red mass of fire. It's almost like it's so boiling over and bursting with fury and rage that it's almost going to kind of separate out into many, many, many other fires. And and separate and in that sense. Subhanallah. Then after that, we've got a narration from Ibn Abi Hatim. Right? He narrates from one of the Sahaba that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, now this is another version of a, another famous hadith which is shorter. Whoever fabricates upon me something that I've not said. So whoever makes something up, whoever fabricates a spurious narration, a fabricated narration, ascribing it to me, then he should, the, the famous hadith is he should make a place for himself in the hellfire. In this one there's an addition. He should make himself a place. He should prepare for himself, like get ready for a place, right in front of the eyes of Jahannam. A place right in front of the sight of Jahannam. SubhanAllah. This, so somebody said, Ya Rasulullah, wa hallaha aynan. Do, does the hellfire have eyes? So he said, yes. Haven't you heard Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying? So he used a verse of the Quran to prove it. And that is from Surah Al-Furqan, verse 12. إِذَا رَأَتْهُمْ مِنْ مَكَانٍ بَعِيدٍ سَمِعُوا لَهَا تَغَيُّضًا وَزَفِيرًا Which we've just read, right? That when the hellfire will see them from a distance, from a far distance. So the hellfire is witnessing the people that are coming to it, right? You, they will then, in that far distance, once hellfire sees them, they will then hear this تَغَيُّض and this zafir. Right, this boiling over, this rage, and and this blaring, and uh, and other uh, other sounds. Allah save us. Allah protect us. Then Ibn Ab uh, Ibn Abbas radiAllahu anhu mentions another thing. He says that when a servant is going to be dragged to the hellfire, hellfire will start blazing and seething. Thereafter, that it will start roaring, and there's going to be nobody left who will not be scared. Everybody will be frightened, frightened be, because of that. Ibn Abi Hatim has transmitted this from Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu. Then uh, another one is from Ka'ab. Ka'ab says there's nothing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created except that it hears the roaring of hellfire both morning and evening twice a day except the human beings. Just us and the jinn, right? The thaqalain, the humans and the jinn. We're the only ones who do not get to hear this. So at night uh, in the evening and in the morning they hear the roar of, roar of hellfire. Because we're the only two creations who are going to be reckoned. We have the hisab and the adab. We have the reckoning and the punishment. So that's why it's only us. Allahumma inni, Allahumma inna na'udhu bika min adab in nar. Allahumma inna na'udhu bika min adab in nar. Remember what we've learned already is that it's something to seek forgiveness from. A refuge. Thereafter that, in the Kitab al-Zuhd of Hannad ibn al-Sari, um, it says, 
that Jahannam every day has two shrieks, has two roars. Everybody except except the uh, Jahannam, except the humans and the jinn, everybody else is to hear them. And that's mentioned from a number of different people. Even Dahak, another great uh, Mufassir, says Jahannam has a roar. Well, this one is actually about the Day of Judgment. Jahannam will roar on the Day of Judgment. Now, this roar of Jahannam, just to give you an idea, I know it just sounds like a depiction. It just sounds like a statement. It's just a description. And it just doesn't seem to bother us. right? Like, okay, we'll deal with it, whatever. Because we can't really fathom this. Now, he describes this. He says that on the Day of Jahannam, not even a intimate angel, a close angel of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nor any prophet who was a messenger, right? When they hear this roar, they will all fall down into prostration. That is how sad and terrifying it's going to be. And they will say, Rabbi, Nafsi, Nafsi, my Lord, myself, myself, I want to save myself. That's how the roar is going to be. Ubayd ibn Umayr says that Jahannam will let out a roar. And there'll be no angel, no prophet, right? who will remain standing. They'll all fall down on their knees, knees and they will be trembling. They'll be saying, Rabbi, Nafsi, Nafsi. And there's numerous narrations about this. Wahab ibn Munabbih, rahimahullah, says that when, uh, when the time comes, when the mountains will be driven, they'll be moved from their place, right, to eventually be flattened, uh, the earth to be flattened. So when the mountains will be driven, they will hear the sound of the hellfire. They will hear its roaring, they will hear its raging, and they will hear its boiling over. Right? And at that time, even the mountains will shriek, just like women shriek right, when they're in an intense pain. And then eventually what's going to happen is that these mountains, and this is just Allah's system, these mountains will essentially fall back on one another until they, until they will crush one another. And maybe that's the process in which they will be that they, they will be flattened out. Imam Ahmad has related this. Ata, one of the students of Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, relates from him that this verse, that when hellfire will see them from a distance, they will then hear from it a roaring and a raging sound. How far is that distance that they will hear that from? It's about a hundred year distance. I mean, in the hereafter, it's like these massive distances. Right? And the reason for that he then explains, and this is a weak narration, but he says that the, the um, he says that on that day Jahannam will actually be dragged onto the field, onto the plane of reckoning, and it will be it will need seventy thousand harnesses, seventy thousand ropes and harnesses, but it's so heavy and so large and so gigantic that 70,000 harnesses, each one of them will be pulled by 70,000 angels. Now that's a huge amount. I mean, that's like this colossal amount, bigger than a pyramid, right? You know, the pyramid, some of the pyramids are such that a person is smaller than one of the stones, one of the big rocks, blocks that have been used for the pyramid. I mean, this is, this hellfire is much, much bigger than that. Allahu Akbar. It will then shriek and roar. It will give one roar. And by that, all, every, any, any tear there is will dry out. It'll do it again. And this time, the hearts will just leap up as though they're leaping up into the throat. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes in Surah Al-Ahzab, verse 10, وَبَلَغَتِ الْقُلُوبُ الْحَنَاجِرِ right? When the, the, the hearts, they leap up basically, and it's almost like they're reaching the throat. I mean, physically, I don't think that happens, but that's what it feels like. It's just this effect that it has on, on a person. Ubaidillah ibn Abi Ja'far, he describes, he says, when the Jahannam roars, right, the hearts of the oppressors, the hearts of the oppressors will essentially split and burst because of that. It will then roar again and they will essentially fly off from the ground. I mean, it'll just lift them off the ground until they will just fall back down, upside down on their heads. That is the roar, that is the roar, just the roar, roaring of, of hellfire. If you've heard the Paradise Lectures, then you will know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has paid attention to every aspect of Paradise. 
and likewise to make hellfire the worst that you 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 can imagine beyond imagination everything has been everything has been designed in that way now this is really really interesting what we're going to learn next this was actually the way of some of the Sahaba, the Tabi'een, and some of even our, our pious leaders of the past. There's so many stories of, for example, Abu Ja'far al-Mansur or Harun al-Rashid or somebody else calling uh, one of the righteous people and saying, please speak to me, right? Tell me something, that, tell me something of the raqa'iq. Tell me something that will soften the heart. And subhanAllah, if you want to read a book on raqa'iq that softens the heart most of these hadith collections has a chapter on that right and the one in uh, mashallah the one in bukhari uh, sahih al bukhari is actually very interesting we're actually covering it right now uh, in another dars um, not a public dars it's a, it's a dars for uh, the, the ulama and um, in in mishkat and all of these it's a beautiful chapter all these heart softening rendering reflective narrations in there so what uh, this, uh, this is that Umar radiallahu anhu once said to Ka'ab, Khawifna, tell us something to frighten us. Tell us something to frighten us. Subhanallah. We use our time in entertainment. If we go to a squad and say, please frighten us, so that we can increase and get some of the fear that's required. So he started, he said, by the one in whose hand is myself the fire will come very close on the day of judgment and it will have a roaring and a seething until when it gets very very close it will again roar and seethe throughout and it's mentioned that there is no prophet and no martyr right now martyrs all of their sins are forg forgotten but each one of these people will also fall onto their knees right in fright such that every prophet and every Siddiq, champion of truth, like the extremely voracious ones, every martyr will say, Allahumma, oh Allah, I do not ask for anything except myself. Subhanallah. Then Ka'ab said to Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, he said, Oh son of Khattab, if you had even, if you had to your name even the the deeds of 70 prophets you would also think that you could still not be saved even if you had with you a balance of the deeds of 70 prophets i mean one prophet's deeds are good enough right 70 of them you would still think it's just the way it is that you will feel like that umar says wallahi in al amr al he says yes this is going to be a very intense matter very intense matter in another version of the same, maybe it's the same incident, or maybe he did this more than once, Umar again said to Ka'ab, uh, he said, scare us, frighten us, give us something that will make us scared. So he gave him the same in the beginning. But in this one he says that each one of the prophets, etc., the angels, the prophets, they will say, my Lord, myself, myself, such that uh, even Ibrahim Ali Salam, Ishaq Ali Salam, and others, and when they said that, all the people in that place began to cry. That were with Umar radiAllahu anhu. Sa'id al Jirmi, whenever he gave a talk, whenever he gave an admonition regarding this, right? Whenever he described the characteristics of those who are fearful, right? Who should be fearful? All of us. He says that. It is as if the roaring of hellfire, it is as if the roaring of hellfire is in their ear. So they're constantly hearing the roaring of hellfire. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy. Likewise, he, uh, from Hassan al-Basri, it says regarding them that when people who are fearful, who have the right amount of fear, when they go past a verse about paradise, like genuinely paradise here, they cry in anticipation and in eagerness that, Ya Allah, give me this paradise. When they pass by a verse in which it's the Jahannam that's mentioned, then they would shriek out, right? It is as if the roaring of hellfire is in their ears. It is as if the roaring of hellfire is constantly in their ears. Ibn Abid Dunya and others have transmitted from uh, Abu Wa'il. 
He says, once we went out with Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, and along, was, uh, along with us was a third person, Rabi ibn Khaytham. Abu Wa'il, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, Rabi ibn Khaytham. And um, there was uh, somebody, you know, there was an oven, a pit in the ground in which somebody was probably, you know, preparing to uh, roast something inside. When Abdullah ibn Umar uh, Mas'ud radiallahu anhu saw this, and he saw the, uh, the, the, the fire in there with its flames just... Uh, uh, roaring and coming up in in the midst of it, he he immediately Im- reminded him of this verse of uh, Surah Al Furqan. Ida ra'atum min makanin ba'idin sami'u laha taghiyu thaw wa zafira, which I've just mentioned. When the hellfire sees them, right, it, they're going to hear the roaring, uh, or uh, they're going to hear the roaring and seething of uh, of hellfire. So, Rabi ibn Khaytham, who was with us, he fell unconscious. When Abdullah ibn Sulaiman recited this, and you think that how can they do this? See, these people were so hot, were so soft, and they were so focused and in tune with the hereafter that these things were easily going to affect them. For us, we have to cut away all the tar from our hearts, all the darkness from our hearts, all the blackness and the spots from our hearts that have appeared because of our sin to soften our hearts. Our hearts are hard, so none of this does anything to us, subhanAllah. None of this does anything to us. Allah soften our hearts. We had to carry him back. We had to carry him back to his family. And then Abdullah ibn Masood radiallahu anhu stayed with him until, so this happened in the morning it seems, until Dhuhr time. And he still had not come back to consciousness. He then stayed with him and looked after him until Asr again he did not come back. Then until Maghrib and only after that. So the, pretty much the full day, uh, the, the daylight hours that this person remained like that. After that Abdullah ibn Masood radiallahu anhu went back to his family. Allahu Akbar. There's another story like this, which is said that once uh, Misma ibn Asim, Misma ibn Asim says that once I spent the night with Abdul Aziz ibn Sulaiman, so Abdul Aziz ibn Sulaiman and Kullab ibn Jari and Salman al Araj, and we were on one of the beaches. We were basically on the coast. So it was four of us. Right? Misma ibn Asim, Abdul Aziz ibn Sulaiman, Kullab ibn Jari, and Salman al Araj. Kullab began to cry. Until we thought that, why is he crying so intensely? It's as if he's going to die. So then Abdul Aziz, Ibn Sulaiman, he began to cry because of seeing him cry. Then after that, Salman started to cry. Now, they remember, uh, with us, people would probably start making fun of one another. But here, these people had all soft hearts, so they started crying. I was the only one left. I could just not understand, right? He says, I also cried because of them crying, but I just couldn't understand what had made them cry. But I saw them in that sorry state and I started crying, right? I mean, we have this impact on one another. I guess that's what human beings. After that, after everybody, you can say, uh, a bit later, I asked Abdul Aziz and I said, Aba Muhammad, what is making you cry like this? Right? He says, Wallahi, you know, when I looked at the ocean and I saw the waves, I saw the waves just crashing upon one another and that just reminded me of the crashing of the flames of hellfire and it's shrieking and it's roaring and so on. And that is what made me cry. I just remember that he made me cry. Then I asked Kullab the same thing. And he said, and it is as if he'd heard his story, like he'd heard the same reason. So he told me the exact same thing. He hadn't. I, I'd asked him separately. He told me the same story that this is exactly what came to him. Maybe, you know, when he saw the first person crying, he looked and he figured it out. Then I asked Salman al-A'raj and he said to me, he said to me that actually among all of us, there's probably nobody worse than me. I'm probably the worst of you all. Because to be honest, my, my crying was not for that reason. My crying was out of compassion for them. I felt so sorry for them that I began to cry. Like why are they putting so much trouble upon themselves why are they putting so much burden upon themselves why are they exerting themselves so much that they're crying like that so I was crying over them he said he says I must be the worst of all of you guys that I didn't cry for the right reason may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us hearts and eyes that cry especially during the month of Ramadan the next chapter which is the 13th chapter of the book it's about mention of it's a short chapter it's about mention of the flames the sparks and the smoke of hellfire, right? And again, that's been described in the Quran and, and uh, in the Hadith. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Waqi'ah, verse 41 to 44, وَأَصْحَابُ الشِّمَالِ مَا أَصْحَابُ الشِّمَالِ 
في سموم وحميم وظل من يحموم لا بارد ولا كريم This is again another place where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has described hellfire. He says that these will the, the people of the left. So there'll be people of the right. There'll be the forerunners who are the best. Then you've got the people of the right who will be good. And then you've got the people of the left. They'll have to be taken towards the left on the, uh, on, on the day of judgment towards hellfire. And then Allah says, Ma ashabu shimal, who are these people? Do you know who they are? They're going to be in samumin wa hamimin. Samum and hamim. Now samum is a fierce blast of fire, right? That's Samum, a fierce blast of fire. That's how it's been described. And Hamim, uh, or it could be, uh, sorry, Samum could mean fierce blast of fire or a scorching wind, right? Samum generally refers to a very hot wind, but here it's a scorching, burning wind, right? And number two, Hamim is boiling water, scalding water, right? Water that will essentially just tear you up and burn burn everything then that's going to be for them that's number one uh, you're talking about the wind water right? shadows of black smoke shadows of intense pitch black smoke that is what Allah says then Allah describes them saying and now before we go on to the next part the next verse What's going on here is Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu says, right, that, well, Ibn Abbas says that this, this is a shadow of smoke, shadow of smoke, of black smoke. And this is what numerous others said, this is the smoke of Jahannam, this is the wind. And this verse really interesting, it's talking about three things that people find relief from heat from in this world. When you're really hot, what do you do? You're going to put on a fan or you're going to open the window and you're going to expect a cool breeze. Because a cool breeze or wind in a hot day, right? if it's a cool one, it's going to be, mashallah, amazing and full of, uh, full, of, uh, full of relief. So that's the first thing. Number two, you want some cold water, right? You want some cooled water. And number three, you want to find a shade. You're looking for a shade because you want to be out of the glare of the sun. These are the three things that you will look for, right? Now, in Hellfire, these three things will be available, but they'll be in the worst position. So the first thing is that the, 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 the wind will actually be a fierce blast of fire, fierce a scorching wind, a burning wind. So that's not going to provide any relief. Number two, the water is going to be boiling, scalding water. And number three, anything that may even resemble, Allah will may make it, I mean, because that's how he describes it, resembling a shadow, uh, a shadow of something so that you can go in there and find some shade. That will be made of black smoke. You'll go in there and you'll probably suffocate. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says in the fourth verse afterwards, La baridin wa la karimin. These things are neither going to be cool, and neither are they going to be refreshing. They're not going to be benevolent in any way. They're not going to be giving you any kind of respite. It's not going to refresh you. It's not going to give you any kind of relief. Allah save us. Then after that, in Surah Al-Mursalat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned something else about this. Allah says in verse 30 of it, إِن طَرِقُوا إِلَىٰ ظِلٍ ذِي ثَلَاثِ شعب لا ظليل ولا يغني من اللهب إنها ترمي بشرر كالقصر كأنه جمالة صفر ويل يومئذ للمكذبين So verse 30 and onwards Allah says uh, speaking to the hellfire, uh, people of hellfire go, go and walk to go and trek and uh, make your way to this shadow to this shade that is made up of three columns. That's what Allah says. This is a shadow, uh, a shade rather, made up of three columns. Three columns of what? So that's where the ulama have explained explained this. Mujahid says, this is actually a shade, three columns of the smoke of hellfire. And in this will be a green flame, a black flame and a red flame. Right? That generally is above fire when you when you kindle fire. Suddhi says 
uh, in the next verse, إِنَّهَا تَرْمِي بِشَرَّرٍ قَلْ right? So what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنْ طَلِكُوا إِلَىٰ ظِلٍ ذِي ثَلَاثِ شُعَبٍ لَا يُغْنِي لَا ظِلٍ وَلَا يُغْنِي مِنَ اللَّهَبِ It's not going to basically benefit you in any way. It's a shade, but it's not going to give you any kind of respite or relief from the fire, right? From the flames of the fire. Right. Then um, Allah says, إِنَّهَا تَرْمِي Instead, إِنَّهَا تَرْمِي بِشَرَّرٍ قَلْ قَصَر um, the fire is going to be throwing up sparks like huge fortresses. So, bisharrin, tarmi bisharrin means that it's going to be essentially spewing out and throwing up sparks. Sharar is a spark. What are these sparks like? Kal qasr. Qasr refers to a palace, a castle, a fortress. They're huge. These sparks are huge. They're going to be, subhanallah, right? That is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions. There is another tafsir that these, these sparks, they're as big as fortresses or it says massive tree trunks. That's why if you look at different translations of the Quran, some have used uh, huge fortresses or castles or palaces and others have used massive tree trunks. They both find they, there's a, a tafsir of both of them. So for example, uh, Hassan, Basri and Dahak, they say that Qasr actually here refers to uh, trunks, right, of huge, huge trees. And uh, others have said the same thing as well. And uh, Quradi, he says, upon Jahannam will be this kind of barrier and anything that will come out of it, it will, uh, any flame that will come out of it will be huge, like uh, as big as palaces and its color is going to be like tar. Thereafter, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, كَأَنَّهُ جِمَالَةٌ sufr. It is as if they are According to one, in, uh, one meaning, yellow camels. One meaning of this is they're like yellow camels. Ibn Abbas says, rather yellow mount, uh, so, sorry, yellow, uh, yellow ships. Others say these are like the ropes that hold a bridge together. So, you know, any, any bridge, if it's going to be held by ropes or big, huge wires, they're going to be very, very thick, right, to be able to take the weight of that. And yet another group say that actually this refers to camel. So whatever it is, it's talking about spewing out uh, and, and appearing like these huge objects. Some have even said actually they're going to, uh, which seems actually very, uh, you know, um, very befitting this. Jimalatun Sufr, according to Ibn Abbas, another version is that these are actually, they're going to seem like pieces of brass or copper. So they're going to be shiny and intensely inflamed okay the next verse regarding this is your uh, in surah al-rahman yursalu alaykuma shuwadhum min narin wa nuhas fala tantasiran so allah says here that there will be sent against them shuwadhum min nar flashes of fire or flashes of smoke wa nuhas and molten brass will be released against them so again, this verse tells us some other punishments there. Imam Nasai and Imam Tirmidhi have transmitted from Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, beautiful hadith, the dust in the path of Allah and the smoke of hellfire can never come together in the stomach of a person ever. If you want to be saved from the smoke of hellfire, which means the smoke, which means the fire itself. I mean, you can't be in the fire without getting to it. smoke first because the smoke is going to get at you first. So this is really good. The only way to, one of the only ways, one of the ways to escape that, right, as according to this hadith, is do something fi sabirillah. There are many things you can do fi sabirillah. Fi sabirillah, going for hajj, going for jihad, going uh, for da'wah. Fi sabirillah, right? Doing anything else, take, undertaking a journey for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to study the knowledge and ilm. That is also fi sabirillah. And in that, I guess you're not gonna, I guess there's gonna be no dust in a five star flight. In a, in a, there's gonna be no dust, you know, in five star arrangements, first class, you know, limousines and chauffeur driven. I mean, there's gonna be no dust in that. Subhanallah, subhanallah.
in Hajj, I guess, regardless of where you go, I mean, I don't know, I've not done a five star um, Hajj with trains, but y you definitely get some of that in there. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept it. So that's the discussion about the smoke and the flames and the roaring and everything else of hellfire. Now we move on to the various different things. This is going to be about the springs of hellfire, the lakes of hellfire, water sources, liquid sources of hellfire. We'll take it bit by bit. It's related from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that he said, Wailun, Wail, is actually a valley of hellfire in which it'll take a disbeliever about 40 years to descend down into, right, before he can get to its depths. Bazaar has another narration from Sa'd ibn Abi Waqas radiallahu anhu where he says that I heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying in the hellfire is a large rock which is called, it's, it's like a mountain, it's like a rock, right? It's called the whale and the people are going to have to, they, they, this is going to be one of the punishments, you know in this world you go to rock climbing, it's an hobby, it's a hobby, it's a, it's a recreation. In hellfire, right, there will be punishments of making somebody climb this rock. SubhanAllah. That's why there's another, I'll, I'll explain this more because there's other narrations that mention Ibn Abi Hatim has transmitted this from, Abu, from Abdullah, that he says, Whale, so whale has been described as a few different things. Mostly whale is a valley in Jahannam full of pus. Yes, I mean pretty much that's agreed upon that it's a place where there's going to be pus that will drip into it from all the people down there, from the boils and everything that will form on their bodies due to the punishment and it will drip into that. Ata ibn Yasar relates that the whale is such a valley made of, of this pus or inflaming pus or whatever it is that if mountains were driven into it, they would actually melt because of it, because of its heat. Malik ibn Dinar says, Whale is a valley of Jahannam in which will contain different forms of punishment. It's almost like, subhanAllah, like a, like a fairground, right, where different things will take place for the people who are there. Now, related to this, there's a verse in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Surah Al Muddathir, verse 17, Sa'urhiquhu su'uda. Which basically means, I will soon force him to climb a steep ascent, a steep hill. They're going to be forced to this, do this mountain climbing. All right. Now, this is related from Abu Sa'id al Khudi radiallahu anhu. He says that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said regarding this, that this is a mountain in hellfire that people will be obliged and forced to climb up. But the way it is, like it's such a crazy mountain, right? That it, it's crazy. When, you, when a person places his hand on it, right, palms on it, his palms will melt. When he raises them, his palms will come back. It's just so hot or whatever, right, but then it'll be regrown. When he puts his foot on there, it will also melt. When he takes his foot off, then it will come off. And it will take about 70 years to climb this. Somehow, they'll be forced to climb up this. And then after that, they will be thrown back down from the other side similarly. Another version from Ibn Abbas alone relates that this is an extremely slippery slope of a mountain right? that a transgressor is going to be is going to be forced to climb and he's going to have to climb it but he's going to keep slipping around on there right until eventually he's going to fall into the uh, into the fire below there's going to be people who's, who are going to be forced to climb this over and over and over again. It's just going to be an activity. It's going to be a punishment activity in Hellfire. They're going to have to be uh, forced to climb on it. And then in order to add some other difficulties there, they're going to be pulled in front of them with the iron chains. And behind them, they're going to be beaten with iron bars. So they're going to have to climb. So they're being dragged up, they have to try to climb it and they're being beaten so they can't stay back, they must climb. But it's not easy to climb and it's all part of the punishment. It's going to take them about 40 years to climb this. Lots of time in hellfire, it's forever. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never allow us to get in there. Okay, I think let us uh, leave it here. The 
next section is about the other values of hellfire which is quite in detail and inshallah we will continue this in our next session so may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to use this Ramadan to develop our fear soften our heart understand and reflect over uh, gain some fear of hellfire and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala turn our entire concentration on gaining paradise because the doors of paradise will be opened up in, uh, in, in Ramadan the doors of hellfire are going to be closed and shayateen are going to be locked up so inshallah this is the time for it There's, if you can't use this time then I don't know what time we can use so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make this a really profitable Ramadan and one better than any before it and really allow us to come out of it clean and purified inshallah Jazakallah khair Allah bless you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khair for listening. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, bless you. And if you're finding this useful, you know, um, uh, as they say, do that like button and subscribe button and forward it on to others. Jazakallah khair and assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.